literally called me and she said, I eat my words. I am sorry. This is liquid gold. I believe that you can do it. For so long, I believe, no, nah, I can't even look at ads. I'll break it. I can't even look at the platform. I'll, I'll, I'll literally stuff it up. I, I, I can't do it. You can do it. Like, don't let anyone else make you think otherwise. Um, are you losing $40,000 or am I losing $40,000? Because I can't sustain this. Their business isn't on the line. Mine is. I got on the phone to them and I was like, hey, we're getting customers say that they haven't received their orders in three weeks. They think we're a scam. Like we're getting bad reviews. Like what is happening? Oh, we're so sorry. We haven't been able to find any staff to fulfill your orders. My makeup's everywhere. Like my skin's showing. Like it was the most vulnerable I'd ever felt. Yeah, ultimately by the time I got home that day, I thought to myself, nah, I'm not gonna sit on the things that I can't control. I'm gonna now work towards things that I can't control. I was all in, skin in the game, no plan B. I had risked everything. So I was like, there is no point half-assing this. And every last penny for a very long time went back into the business. I had no marketing budget when I launched back then. And then even if I had a marketing budget, I would still be putting that into stock to get the product into people's hands. And that's what I wanted. I just wanted yellow tubes in people's hands everywhere. Within less than two years, you went from corporate finance to Forbes 30 under 30. You had a wait list of 50,000 and you sold one every second on launch week. Crazy, yeah. I think the biggest lesson and learnings that I've kind of thought back on in my journey is all right, guys, this is an absolutely awesome episode. It's another really good e-com one for you guys. Priscilla from Bang & Body, one of the most iconic, one of the most successful Australian e-com brands of the last five, six years. She's absolutely killed it. Both e-com, both retail, launches selling out in minutes, selling a product every second for some of her new product launches. So for you brand builders and e-com lovers, this is going to be one of your favorite podcasts that I think we've done for a very long time. Um, so we'll get into it in a second, but can ask for a few favors before we get into it. If you're watching on YouTube, could you like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already? They both take a couple seconds, but they mean so much to me and they really help the channel grow. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, if you could leave us a five-star review, I'd really, really appreciate it. It helps more than you know. Um, and it just helps me get bigger and better guests all the time and hopefully bring more value to you guys. So thank you for everyone that's been doing it lately. I really do appreciate it. Let's get into the podcast. All right, we're back. We've got another e-com one. I know you guys love the e-com one. So this is probably one of the best we could do in Australia at the moment. Priscilla, I should have asked you before we started recording, how do you pronounce your last name? Just the way it's spelled. So Hadji and Tony. Hadji and Tony. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. <laughs> Founder of Bang & Body, obviously the yellow tube of goodness. I'm sure everyone's seen them over the last five and a half years. You've been absolutely everywhere since 2019 when you launched now. We just had about a half an hour chat off air, mini podcast. Um, but before we get into the real podcast, I want to share just a couple of facts and stats uh, about you and the business for the people listening that are in e-com because there's a lot that maybe what, don't know exactly who you are, just so I can kind of frame some of that. So again, Bang & Body launched in March, 2019, after two to three years of conceptualization. So a lot of work prior to the launch, which I'm really excited to talk about because I think a lot of podcasts sometimes skip past that and start, okay, well, tell me about launch day. Um, and you really, really went all in on, on this business for those that don't know, invested your whole house deposit to start the business. So a lot of questions around that. And then um, you're able to go within less than two years, you went from corporate finance to Forbes 30 under 30. Um, since you've la launched, you and the Bang & Body team have sold over 600,000 firming body lotions. Um, you launched the Illuminating Lotion with, I was crazy when I saw this, obviously we're chatting to Jessie, got some um, good little facts and figures off her, Jessie Marshall from HQ High, for those wondering, read right on the podcast not long ago. Um, you had a wait list of 50,000 and you sold one every second on launch week. Crazy, yeah, crazy. Um, and then even last year, so four or five years into the process, Bang & Body achieved 20% month on month growth, which is just crazy to be able to do that. So for those listening that weren't aware, pay attention because this is a really, really good success story and she's done it all completely self-funded, no investment to this day. So Priscilla, congrats on, you know, the success you've had so far and thank you for coming into the podcast. Wow. <laughs> I've never had an intro like that before. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited to share my journey. And yeah, I think, you know, it's something that I'm really proud of, but it wasn't all easy and um, definitely wasn't something that um, happened overnight. So yeah, excited to get stuck in. For sure. And like to do a bit of research, I always read a bunch of articles and listen to some other podcasts you've been on. And there was a lot. So I thought I'll message Jessie because she, she always has the, she put, puts them down so good. <laughs> She's the best. Um, but one question I, I like to start with at times and I think just the more I got to know you from your story, this question kind of answers itself. And what I want to ask was like one moment or experience from your childhood that you think shaped you, but clearly, I mean, 15 years of like the skin issues that you went through seems like a pretty big, you know, shaping of, of Priscilla. Talk to me about your motivations and that experience that led you to creating what is Bang & Body today. 
Yeah, thanks. I love that question. Um, yeah, so I suffered with my skin for 15 years, hormonal acne and eczema, eczema that runs in my family. So I was always the sensitive kid, <laughs> the one that get a lot of things didn't work with, um, even like eating habits, like sensitive gut, just a lot of things I just was going wrong for me. Um, I'm a twin. So oh, you're a twin. That's yeah, awesome. So my twin, um, she had the beautiful glowing skin and I did not. So um it was hard. Took a lot um a lot of like a big toll on my mental health and my self-confidence and something that I definitely had to overcome. But it just wasn't as it, it was hard. Like I think growing up in the age that I was and the world that I lived in then. Like things have shifted now, thankfully. I think there's definitely a lot more empowerment and awareness around, you know, feeling good in your own skin, being who who you are, you know, your uniqueness makes you you. Like just because you have a breakout doesn't mean that you're less than. Like all those things that we're trying to work on now, I didn't really have that when I was struggling and I felt really alone. I wouldn't even see my twin sister or my mom as I got older I moved out of home, um, had an apartment and yeah, I feel like I was in my corporate job working, um, long hours, quite stressful, trying to get up, you know, work up the ladder, like, you know, that world. And yeah, my skin kind of just got progressively worse from that. But I think in terms of my motivation outside of my own personal struggles and things that made me feel not worthy. Um, my mum and my auntie had hair and beauty businesses. And so I saw my mum be very entrepreneurial and she was a go-getter. So my mum is very much like, you're not happy, go to the next thing, try different things. If you're passionate about something, make your dream a reality. And my auntie, who's like my second mum, who I love them both. She's very much, you know, nine to five, have a trade, say, have a career, yeah. back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. <laughs> Um, you know, play within your means, like very much structured. So mm. I think I was very influenced by both, which I think my mom always, you know, gave me that entrepreneurial drive of like, follow your passions, go after your dreams. You know, I was working a nine to five and in the corporate game and I'm very proud and happy I did that. I did instill a lot of resilience and a lot of characteristics that is needed in, you know, in business and and being an entrepreneur. Um, but I think the way that I've been able to keep the brand hundred percent bootstrapped with no loans, no debt, no nothing is because I've had the mentality of my auntie, who's always instilled that backup mentality, to play within your means. Like, yes, you know, take risks, but take calculated risks. Like I've had both. Like, so yeah. I think growing up, having both of those dynamics instilled with me, I, at the time when I was going through my skin concerns quite intently, I became like this unaccredited like formulations person because I was Googling all the ingredients on the back of packaging. I was so addicted. It was literally an addiction. Like I think at the time where I thought enough was enough, I packed up all my creams and lotions and skincare products and I gave a big box to my mom and I said, take it away. Because wow. at that point, I think I found that I was going through the actual manufacturing um, experience. Um, once I had got there, I realized that I was definitely overcompensating for my skin. I was putting things on my skin that was over um, with too many actives. So it just couldn't settle. It was fighting against each other and stripping my skin and ultimately compromised my skin barrier for a very long time. Um, and so, yeah, I think definitely the influences of my mom and my auntie and my own skin concerns definitely shaped me. And then working in corporate and feeling I was fulfilled in a sense that I felt I was achieving because I'm a high achiever and like yeah. I want, I've got, you know, my mum from a young age instilled a very high work ethic for us as girls. Like I've got two sisters. So, you know, any opportunity that is given, you go above and beyond, yeah. you work hard, you do the right thing by your employer, you like very much instilled that narrative. And so I guess I was like one of the youngest people within my um, sector in corporate business banking and working up the ladder in that way, I thought, okay, is this, this is just the trajectory while I was going home and being completely addicted with my skin and researching. And I just never put the two together at that point. And I was doing a lot of project management when I was in corporate. So again, very similar to starting a business. You have an idea, conceptualization of something, and then you build a roadmap and yeah. execute. So that was my bread and butter. But again, I didn't know all these pieces until I was on a train on the way to work, crying my eyes out, 
for an hour and a half because I couldn't cover my skin that day and I had a massive presentation. And that was like the first time in God where I, I, I always felt self-conscious, but that time it was my lowest I think I've ever felt. And I called my mom and I just cried because I was like, what else am I going to do? Like I'm literally distraught. People are looking at me on the train. Like My makeup's everywhere. Like my skin's showing. Like it was the most vulnerable I'd ever felt. And mom's like, my mom was just like, it's breaking my heart. Like you've been through so much. You've suffered so much. Like maybe through this pain and suffering, there's maybe other people like you that are also looking for a relief, also looking for a solution. She's like I don't know anyone more capable, determined, aware of skin, understanding the formula. Like she goes, you Google and look at ingredients like it's a magazine. Like you, you that's what you like doing. And I said, oh my God, I, I never thought of it that way. And I kind of sat with that for a bit and I got off the phone and I cried more because I was so overwhelmed. But ultimately I sat with it for a bit. And from that day after, like normally again, work back on the train, back home, I would be thinking about how can I treat my skin? How can I, you know, feel better? How can I and then, yeah, ultimately by the time I got home that day, I thought to myself, no, nah, I'm not going to sit on the things that I can't control. I'm going to now work towards things that I can control. And that was an eight-year, sorry, an eight-month journey from going, you know what, my mindset is changing. I'm going to put my corporate responsibilities that I know and like that I can do that I'm good at, the bread and butter of project management into play. And I just kind of built this business plan that was like, okay, if it was a product, what would it be? What products would it like, what would it solve? How would it help me? Mm. What demographic would it be? Like I just put all the plan in place. Um, and yeah, that was eight months until the day that I had to finally tell my husband, now husband, partner before, boyfriend before, um, that our whole life savings, every dollar would potentially be up (laughs) for a business venture rather than a house. Um, and how did that conversation go when you when you told your then partner? Um, okay, so I think it was like, yeah, it was about eight months in that I had been just dawdling on the train and kind of keeping it to myself. Like he obviously knew that I had a very big interest in skin. He had been with me since I was 14. So he saw my Into whole skin journey, all the crying, all the, no, I'm not going to family functions, that whole, everything. Um, he was with me for the long run. And... Yeah, got to the eight-month mark and he was like, okay, I think we've saved enough money for, you know, to look at investing in a house and we've saved for four years. So, you know, let's look at it. And I said, uh, actually, I have another idea and I want to run it past you. And if you don't want to do it, it's fine. Like, I totally get it. I don't want to ruin our plans, if mm-hmm. you know. And he just like looked at me and said, I, because I told him the plan and he was like, loved it but he's like even he goes I didn't even need to hear the plan he's like I back you I love you I want you to see how beautiful you are without you feeling like people are looking at you and just your skin so even if it just helps you I'll be happy Mm. and I'm like so you're willing to and I was literally like you know kind of putting my arms out I'm like you're willing to put all this money potentially in the bin because we have to be realists we don't know how this was going to turn now things guaranteed and not that I was saying that because I think my work ethic and determination would never let that happen. But I think I just had to paint it black and white for the risk. They of, have to be aware and willing worst correct, case scenario. Right? Correct. Especially because we had both invested a lot of money in this pool this of vision, savings. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, so are you okay with this? And he said, yes, I'm more than willing. I said, okay, but you're happy for us to go back home, like to my mum's because, you know, like, yep, whatever it takes. I was like, okay, cool. And so pretty much from that moment, it was a three-year journey to getting it to launch. And then, yeah. So that, that process, you know, the eight months of like research you got, well, it's all, it sounds like it's all you would think about outside of what you had to do, right? Literally. Did it start as just, okay, how do I fix this issue for myself? Or was there always from the start, I'm going to make a business or that became a realization after the conversation with your mom? Yeah, I think my mum just gave me the awareness piece that there is something more to me just feeling sorry for myself because <laughs> that's literally what was happening. And she's like, I hate, she would say like, seeing you so upset, like made me so upset. Like mm-hmm. I just, and I think she felt like it was her fault because also she had really bad acne till she was about 35. So hereditary and, you know, I obviously took after my mum. And I just kept saying, I can't be 35 mum and still go through <laughs> this. Like I was just, yeah, like 
it just, for me, I think she just gave me that awareness on there's more to life than being so fixated on your skin. And yeah, I think for me, that moment, I thought, you know what? I know what I can control. I know what I can do. And that's build a plan because I do that every day in my job. I know how that works. I'm just going to build a plan and be like, if I could wave a magic wand, what would that product, what would that, you know, price point ingredient, like Mm. from all the things that I could not find for me, what would I want that to be? And so, yeah, it definitely started with my own pain points. And then I think um, it evolved organically. But again, it wasn't necessarily a business because I was literally building a plan for a product and I launched a product, which was the yellow tube, which is now famous, which is so weird, (laughs) (laughs) this famous yellow tube. And it's still the heartbeat of our brand, Mm. you know, and everything's- That's still a cool product. 100%. And the tube was our core product for, God, maybe four years. And Uh, now our jumbo of that same product has overturned that to being the number one and we cannot keep it in stock. Crazy. So I just feel- you know, sometimes and it just, I don't know, sometimes it's, for me, I think if you find, if you have a pain point that is really affecting your mental and who you are as a person and you feel like you can solve that problem, even if it takes you one day or three years like me, um, there is something to that because I wasn't thinking, you know, I'm going to build a business, I'm going to be successful, I'm going to quit my nine to five. Like that wasn't even on the horizon. That was not even in my viewpoint. I was like, I want to create a product that is going to finally help heal my skin or manage my skin that potentially I could then go and help others. For me, it was about my own self-preservation and how I could live a fulfilled life and knowing that if I could do that for myself, then maybe I could do that for others. And that's, I think, where the heart has always been for the brand, you know? And it's crazy. Like, look how good your skin looks now. Thank you. Perfect, right? (laughs) Thank How old you. were you when you started that like whole journey, mid-20s, early 20s? I was 22. 22. When I started conceptualizing. Yeah. Because I was, I had acne in school, um, probably like year 10, year 11. It was mainly like on like the sides of my face and, and my neck. Right. And and that's as a guy in in in, in that age. And I remember I took a racketine, which, did you ever try that? Well, Luckily. that's the thing I tried to avoid harsh oh. medications. I was on steroids. I was the clinical, like yeah, white, white bottled. Like I felt like I had a disease because yep. you couldn't go near the pretty packaging. That was just like a recipe for disaster and why it led and why I led Bang Body to be the color it is because we can go in that just a bit. But yeah, I thankfully never took Roactane because that's something that I- So bad. It was really, yeah, something that I just thought I don't want my hormonal and immune to be compromised even though I was, I was almost there. Like I was literally saying to mom, take me like, and, yeah. and then, I, but I was like, I was fighting with myself because I know of the symptoms and the repercussions, mm-hmm. but I did take, like I did have steroids and comp- like um, harsh ingredients that would dry out your skin, but it would compromise your bar- skin barrier. So yeah, I went through it all. Just a quick one from me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'd know that after scaling Happy Skin Co. to over $10 million per year, I spent close to 18 months creating the Viral Brand Builder program which teaches someone with zero experience how to launch and scale their very own e-commerce brand. With over 100 training videos and direct access to me, including one-on-one calls, you'll be guided throughout the entire process. Now, we already have a bunch of incredible results from students that are making multiple five and six figures per month. So if you want to learn how to build a business that has the potential to completely change your life, then click the link in the description and book in an application call today. Spots are limited as you'll be speaking directly to me. So hopefully I'll chat to some of you soon, but until then, let's get back to the podcast. I know a girl, um, not close with her or anything, but I know a girl that, again, she was probably mid to late twenties when, when, when she went through this, she'd been struggling with her skin for, for obviously like probably 10 years at that point. And it got so bad that she decided to take Rakuten. Um, And then it worked for her. And she, I remember seeing on her stories, oh my God, this was the best thing I ever did. Like, I'm so glad I did this. And I thought, oh, wow, like good for her because I know how, how it can go. And then I remember like a few months later seeing it, like come on her stories again and just being like, you know, I spoke about this journey publicly, so I need to share this. Like the last few months has been the hardest of my life, like in terms of like mental health and depression because they're going to have such like harsh, severe you know, side effects on your body. She's like, even though it cleared up my skin, I would you know, do anything to take it back and left, go back yeah. to that. I'm left with this mental that she can't shake. It's, yeah, and that's scary. the thing I think for me, that's was my fears. So mm. I 
always tried to do everything else. Like that was going to be my very, very last resort. Yep. Um, and so at that time I decided that I was going to be the guinea pig for bang a body like at that point because my skin was still in the like peak of it being hormonal yeah. and, and and ultimately breaking out. Like it was at the pinnacle of what I was trying to heal. Um, and not only was it present on my face, like I had it on my body as well, but body you can hide it with clothes mm-hmm. and makeup you can try hide it on your face but ultimately it's not the same and I felt I feel for guys because it's not the same either like you you know you can't really and it's so sad to say hide like we try to hide but yet it's something that's so normal but it's not considered normal so I don't know like I feel like for me I think times are changing and where I think for me and our message like we want to make sure that we're also communicating that we're providing a solution Mm -hmm. like we're not saying that we're going to transform or that you have to change or that you're not good enough. That's not anywhere near our messaging. It's like, we understand the mental, we understand the psyche, we understand like the vulnerabilities of going through what I went through. I know firsthand. So if I can help alleviate some of that stress and some of that um, self like confidence or the anxiety that is ridden through that, well, then you're going to live a happier day and you're going to be able to show up in your work. You're going to be able to show up you know, with your family and actually attend. I used to hide. I used to not even go to family events because mm-hmm. I was so embarrassed. So I think, um, yeah, going through that and deciding that it was time that, okay, once I got the go ahead from my now husband, um, we yeah embarked on this three-year journey and I became the guinea pig. And I started out with one manufacturer who I said, you know, if it doesn't clear my skin, well then it's not going to go to market. Yeah. Like I'm not going to saturate the market further because of a brand or a success story or to make money. That's not what this is about. And like, I, yeah. yeah. And I think there's a really like cool lesson in, in that conversation you had with, with, with your mother and then your realizations after in that, you know, often when we hit our lowest points or we feel like we're at rock bottom, you have a decision to make. And it's like, I can sit in the emotion of it and just keep sp- spiraling around in a circle. Or, and and for some things in life, we don't have control and, and that's a different story. But a lot of these things, there are a lot of parts of that that we can control. And if we, if you're stuck in a really emotional problem, even just the awareness or the starting of the process to, to work on a solution and you can spend your time and your energy working towards that. For me, in my experience, once you've started that process and you're solution focused rather than problem focused, like that's where the magic can happen. Totally. And you just feel so much better. Do you, you don't feel like this is a life sentence anymore yeah. and you can start working on it. And it brings a lot of, you know, renewed energy and hope for, for what the future can look like. So I think that's a really cool point you made for people that are listening that maybe are feeling like they're at their low points and like let the low points are often like the springboard for the, for the best things that ever happen. And it's a, it's a choice. And I know there is, you know, strategy and tactics and things that you had to go and implement for it to turn into such a success story. But if it was, you know, a 10th of the success it is now, you still would have been like drastically in a better position than when you were, when you started. hundred percent. Like even if the product just helped my skin, exactly. I would have been, I would have been stoked. I would have been like, oh my God, I won the lottery. Yeah. Like, you know, I think when you truly understand the vulnerabilities of skin, like people don't necessarily talk about it. They think, okay, if you have anxiety or you are suffering with depression, like it's other factors, but mm-hmm. people don't talk about the psychology around skin that could be linked to anxieties and depression. So that connection is where I felt significantly alone because it's not something that I could just talk to my twin who had flawless skin and she could understand or yeah. talk to my mom who was like, oh, darling, it's fine. Like you'll grow out of it. It's all good. Like there was really no like relatability there. And that's when I really kind of suffered in silence. And yeah, I think when you are strong enough to have an opportunity to focus on something else and that's the thing, like it's always going to be like, I think, you know, when you get to a low point, it's definitely easier said than done to be like, you know, find something and, and get out, like, or get over it or get like, that's just awful. Like people saying to people, get over it in a place that they feel like they really can't get out of, um, definitely needs to have some awareness around it. But I think if there is something that you can grab onto that is going to bring you joy or build happiness and you fixate on that rather than fixate on your emotional state, 
your life in itself will just transform 100%. mentally. Yeah. And then you can focus on things that make you happy and you can focus on things that give you drive and give you motivation. And then through that, that's when you can grow personally and professionally, whether it's a business or in a corporate career or 100%. wherever. And like, you know, so many people that, that would be able to relate to this, like you said, you were working in a corporate role and you were really unfulfilled. And if you're in that position in a certain job and you're pigeonholed into that and, you know, you got to earn your money because you got to pay rent and you got to pay bills and maybe you have kids and at the end of the, the week you've paid all your expenses, you only have like a hundred, couple hundred dollars left to speed, don't really have much to work with. Then like thinking, okay, I can be stuck in this forever or I can think, what am I passionate about? Go learn some skills or retrain in that, do a night course at uni or TAFE or, you know, it doesn't even have to be these formal education, just start learning on the, on, on the side. And then, you know, like you said, reverse engineer a plan from where you are to where you want to be and just start taking the first step and like your mood and everything in your life can change just when you've started that journey. Totally. Like when I shifted my mindset from jumping on a train, feeling sorry for myself to working on something that inspired me, gave me hope. You know, I could, you know, get my whole analytical brain working. I could, you know, I, I was doing that anyway. So why not apply what I was doing in my actual job into something that I felt that I had a personal connection with? And yeah, I was literally addic addicted to skin and skincare and I just was obsessed. It was, an, it was actually a, a bad obsession. Like it wasn't a positive one because I was, you know, constantly buying products to just help fix my skin. And when I think I s decided to give that box of, products to my mom, it was then and there that I was like, no, no more. Like I'm going to strip it back, keep it simple, you know, just have a really natural gentle moisturizer. None of this harsh stuff that I'm being prescribed, like literally just no, like nothing in it to, it was like, okay, maybe it was to the point where there was really nothing in it, but I was like, I need to go to the bare basics. I need to see what my skin actually does when I'm not putting things on my skin. Was there Sorry to cut. Was there an element of that being freeing for you? Totally. Mentally? Totally. I was like, it's not controlling me anymore. Yeah. And I don't feel like I'm stuck in this vortex mm -hmm. on this hamster wheel that I'm constantly trying to fix. Instead, I'm I'm freeing myself of, you know, expectation. I'm freeing myself of, you know, the way the the way I should be or what I should be using. Like I just stopped it then and there. And by stripping it back, I actually saw the magic unfold because even though I was the guinea pig for the products that I was going to be making. And I was in that journey. What I realized as soon as I stripped back all the products, my skin started to stabilize. Yeah. And just like, even though it wasn't like amazing, it was better. It was less sore. It was less red. It was less um, angry. And I think that's what built the philosophy around our simple and effective solution with Bang & Body because we really only focus on core products that you need in your routine mm. that have long lasting results and can live with you. You know, it's not time consuming. It's not a five, it's not a 50 step routine. It's not five different cleanses. Like there might be people out there that love that. And that's amazing and great for those businesses. But for me, I want it to be a very simple process because even though for me, I was addicted, it did feel like a chore mm -hmm. and it felt like a very costly one. Also as well, to link back on what we we're just talking about, like I know, and and to your point, I 100% agree. Like we're all, we're all guilty of this. Like while you're in your problem, while you're in the struggle, it's really hard to see, you know, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel or to see it as a positive. But if we look back at for like, I'm assuming, you know, five to seven years of your life, this was your biggest struggle, your biggest challenge. Now look at the last five years and the rest of your life, it's turned from your biggest struggle to the biggest gift. Yeah, 100%. So, and it doesn't always have to be a business, you know, figure out what your problem is, turn into a business. But it's just like one example of like, you know. Oh, your life can change, can change literally. Like I think I think the biggest lesson and learnings that I've kind of thought back on in my journey is once you shift your focus to something positive, your days are going to be happier. And it could be anything. It could be you deciding to sp to leave work at a reasonable hour to spend time with your partner or your family. It could be you going on a shopping date because you haven't sport yourself in three years. Like it could be anything that you feel that you find joy to shift your mindset, to shift your endorphins in your body for what you feel inspired by and happy by. It's, it's game changing. hundred percent. And I think like to, you know, connect this to business more and, you know, there is only so many products out there. A lot of people that are the e-com crowd are looking for, you know, the next winning product or whatever. And sometimes you'll see an opportunity and it'll be a great fit and you'll go for it. But I think like if you can, if it's an option, if you find something like you did and you find something that you are obsessed with, the power of momentum and the power of like, 
you putting all of your being into that, like you're living proof of how effective that can be. So if there's like a couple of options and maybe one looks like a little bit better of a product, you know, if you're looking at your product criteria, but one you're so passionate about and obsessed with, go with that. Because like you said before, oh, yeah. you, that's where you have long-term su- sustained success and fulfillment. Totally. And I think that's a good call out because at the end of the day, you know, the love and the passion and the joy of what you're doing is only going to help you during the challenges and the tough times. If there's something that you're not passionate about, it's going to be far harder to persevere than something that you really love and you know is your calling or you know that you have to 100%. do this. And I think that's the difference. You know, the there's going to be more challenging days in any startup, in anyone's entrepreneurial journey. And if it's not exactly what you want to do, then how are you going to get out of bed that day? It's just going to be like you're back into a nine to five. Like, mm-hmm. and I think that's, you've got to, like, people have to be real with themselves about that, you know? I'm sure there would have been many times where you never seriously considered it, but like you just wish, oh, life would be so much easier if I didn't start this, right? And if you weren't so passionate about it, that's why so many people, you know, so many people come to me and be like, you know, I've tried multiple times before and I always give up and quit. It's like, you need to find a a good enough reason why. So to take that back to the process, obviously you've got that project management kind of mindset from everything you're doing at work. What were some of the steps that you put into place to turn an idea into like this passion into a real life business? Yeah, I think definitely taking um, a concept that I guess was so close to my heart and something that I guess I could link to my corporate career, which again, I'm very thankful for. Um, I was able to build a plan and map out exactly what I felt, even if it was just for me, because I'm the customer. Like I think I pointed out from the beginning, like this was a problem that I wanted to fix personally. I didn't necessarily think I'm creating a product that's going to fix problems for multiple people around the world. Like it just, I'm great. too complicated, I'm, I'm right? I'm grateful to that that happens out. now, but I'm not, that was not what I was thinking about. I was just thinking I have this problem and I am a problem solver. If you ask anyone in the family for as long as my mom said, since you're a tiny tot, like you've always been the problem solver at school, the advisor, people coming to you. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? So I think for me, it's in my nature just to find problems to solutions but at that time when I, my skin was so bad, the only solution that I could think about was buying more products. There wasn't any other option until my mum gave me the light bulb mo- moment. Um, so then by putting a plan in place, I could go, okay, who was my ideal customer, which was me? You know, what was my main pain points? Okay, I have a problem with my like breakouts on my face and body and eczema, so my skin sensitive. I just had a lot of criteria for ultimately having the most temperamental skin which again, I think was a good thing because I then knew I could cater to quite a lot of people, sensitive, problematic, you know, combination, hormonal, all of that. Um, And so I kind of put that in place and identified where potentially I could invest. So yeah, who was my customer? What problems did I want to resolve? What form of product would it be? Like, was it going to be a cleanser? Was it going to be a moisturizer? Definitely around skin. Like, so where was I going to land on that? Ideally, the price point, you know, what like philosophies, did I want to make it in Australia? Did I want it with an Australian sourced ingredients? Did I want it to be vegan or my non-negotiables? Like, again, all these through my research and um, understanding around skincare products because I would just Google and research formulations because my skin was so sensitive, so I couldn't put anything on my skin. So in so all the pain and all the hardship of not finding products that worked for me actually worked in my favour because then I could build out a plan of, okay, this ingredient's okay, this is good, this does well, this mimics your natural, you know, oil in the skin or this helps with this. So I was able to build out a a pretty decent plan. Um, And then from there I think I realised that we're conformed to understanding the philosophy around the beauty industry with categorization. So face, body, hair, fragrance, you know, da 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 Um, And that just didn't work for me because I was – annoyed that I constantly had to buy so many different products for my body and my face. And I just thought, what if there was a new way of doing this? And again, like I'm going up against thousands of traditions. Like we are all raised to do a skincare routine in a certain set way, but what is missed is the way that people live. And I think that's where Banger Body has been able to grow and succeed because we align with the values of our customer. And that's pretty much formulating face first. So the way that you would formulate a face product, we make it larger. So therefore your body gets what your face is getting. And so I think as well too, a lot of the time our bodies are neglected, but they're the first signs of aging. 
So I read a stat that nearly like I was very like, wow, okay, that's scary. Um, so pretty much after the age of 18, we lose 1% of elasticity every year. And skin is our largest organ. So why is it that we're investing thousands and thousands of dollars in our face care, but yet we start to aging from our neck, our hands, our delicatage. And so I think for me and being raised by a mom, very much skin first, she was very big on being a pioneer in natural skincare. She did try to help me with my skin, but again, like it just, I needed a harsher, like it just, yeah, you get, there wasn't back then with natural skincare, it wasn't as effective as what we have today. Like the technology, it just wasn't as strong. Um, and so I think watching my mom and, you know, I remember walking into the bathroom one day and she's like rubbing this firming lotion on her or something. I don't know. She's, everything was firming. And I <laughs> was like, mom, what's this firming? She's like, oh, darling, you know, your older self will thank you. And I was like, oh, okay. And then I started researching about firming and that's when I saw the stat. And then I was like, hang on a minute. I'm sure there's something to this. Why can I bridge? I want to bridge the gap. I want to bridge the ca- gap about, around trying to provide a solution for skin now, but also prevent and protect the skin for the future. So bridge them together. And yeah, that's, I guess, where our yellow tube. I still born. remember, I reckon it would have been in your first year at some time in the Preston's office. One of the girls came in with, with Bang Body and putting it on. I'm like, whoa, I've never put cream on my skin that made it like almost tingle before. I'm like, <laughs> like this is actually doing something. That was wild the first time. And the last time I've never tried another product that's done that as well, that I really felt like, holy shit, something's happening to my skin. Um, but to get to that product and I know, you know, you've spoken about this before, but I found it such an interesting problem and process you went through, but talk to me about going through the process with the first manufacturer Yeah, and then what happened next, because I think there's a massive lesson and you did something that not a lot of people would have, and clearly it was the right decision, but would have been a difficult one. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, so when I started my journey in actually starting to manufacture our products, um, I found a manufacturer in Sydney and we started the process. It was about eight months in and I think I'd spent, God, maybe $80,000. So yeah, we had like a hundred thousand dollar budget because that's literally every dollar that we owned, um, for this house deposit. And yeah, we invested every last penny into the business, 80,000 being the first manufacturer. And we were with them, I think for eight months or yeah, just, I think close to a year, but At that time, I just felt like they weren't pushing to where I felt the brand could go. Mm -hmm. So they were like, yep, this is a sample. Do we get sign off? No, you do not get sign off. Okay, yes, it's maybe helped my skin feel a little bit softer or it's helped with this, but it's not wow. There's no, the dry down's not good. I can't put my jeans on, you know, quickly. Mm -hmm. And I used to hate that. Mine was like, you know, my mum made us wear SPF and moisturize every day. You know, even if you're wearing jeans, stockings, like got before school, like it was just, it was a chore and like I wanted to take a problem that I felt and make it something enjoyable, enjoyable. So um, I said, no, nope, the dry down's not fast enough. No, nope, it feels greasy. No, nope, that's that's not working for my skin. It's it's broken me out. That ingredient doesn't work with this. We've got to remove that. So I was challenging them and I think they just didn't like that being mm-hmm. that I was a new business and I wasn't going to be putting in 10, 20,000 purchase orders straight up. So they're like, oh, they're probably thinking, why are we wasting our time with this person? I think in the end, that's probably what happened. Um, but I was never going to settle. I wasn't going to continue to add to the saturation of the problem in this industry. That's where I was struggling. And so if I just did that, then I'm no better than all the other brands that have just put up products that didn't work for my skin. They might work, but they didn't work for me. Mm. So I had to change that narrative. And so I remember calling my now husband being like, so I think I'm breaking up with our manufacturer. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, I thought it was pretty close. I'm like, yeah, but it's not close enough. It's not perfect. Like I'm not launching something that I'm not proud of, that I can't use every day, that I'm not obsessed with. And even now it's funny, like I'm so happy I didn't settle because every time I put on Bang & Body, I'm like far out, that's amazing. Like, and it's not <laughs> me being biased. It's literally because I'm just like, holy hell. Like, you know, and I just, I don't know. I feel like I was never going to settle on something that I wasn't going to be obsessed with. And I decided to go back to the drawing board. So broke up with that manufacturer, pretty much lost $80,000. But I guess we had a good base of what like not to do. Like we had a base of like, we want to push this further. So I found another manufacturer who at the time gave me two hours of their time on the phone. And I thought, wow, that's, that's different. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not like any other manufacturer. 
and they weren't pushy. They were like, look, think about it. Like, you know, we'll love to work with you. But, you know, and I told them the whole circumstance and everything. And they're still our manufacturer to this day, eight years on. And, so cool. yep, we have the best relationship. And so grateful for, for them for aligning with me and my values and willing to push the boundaries with so me. So what was it? Because I know a lot of people go through this when they go through the contract manufacturing process when you're trying to create something new. You're going back. You know you have that, you know, expectation of what you wanted to be and you're sensing this like frustration and this pu- pushback and almost, I know what they try and do. They put like, trust me, like we know, like who, who are you to question us in a way? What inside you was telling you, no, nah, I have to like trust my intuition and just Be- follow yeah. through? I think because I tried thousands of moisturizers previously to that and I just was like, I know this isn't what I want. Like I, I know this kind of is already out there. And whether, like for me, owning our IP was the most important part. Non-negotiable. But whether so. they actually built the brand, like built the formula from my specs or whether it was a base white labeled product that they were trying to build off, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But that's where I think they couldn't push it further because I read between the lines. Yeah. And at that point, yeah. I think it just gave me kind of concerns and red flags. And I was like, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done with this. I would rather lose $80,000 than bring out something that isn't going to last the test of time or isn't something I'm going to be proud of or isn't going to be a positive um, experience for our customer, you know? And then on the more business side as well, if they're working off like a white label base, it's going to be easier for people to try and reverse engineer that and copy your products in the future as well. So there's a lot of red flags. Yeah. Um, You go with the next manufacturer, they're great. I suppose from that process, trial and error, some really good experiences, some not so good experiences for anyone that is going through that, you know, contract manufacturer process, whether it be food, hair, you know, nail, whatever, consumables, what would be like your main piece of advice or main lesson for navigating that process? Yeah, I think definitely asking them what their priorities are. I think I think that's something that's so easily missed. Like, you know, uh, do they prioritise natural-based ingredients? Are they locally sourced? Do they do global sourcing? You know, are there many iterations to your sample? What are the costs involved for further iterations? Um, you know, looking at benchmarks, do you have amazing products that you feel like you can make better that you can show them, but make sure they don't copy, but Mm. you know, you've got a good communication piece around what does that look like? Um, I definitely think having a good relationship and just being open, upfront and honest. And especially if you're new, I think showing them a bit of your plan of how you're going to launch these products, what your point of differences are, because they want to know that you're going to give them repeat business. If they know you're going to give them repeat business, well, then they might invest that little bit more into you and getting to know you and what your needs are to therefore make it work. But I definitely think understanding their priorities, what makes them a manufacturer that you should align with and just ensure the values are aligned. And I think that's what I realized with the other manufacturer, there were certain alignments that were missing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that was a really good point that you made. Like obviously you want to be making sure they fit your bill of what you're looking for and you're aligned on values, but also to be realistic and and have the awareness that they are a business as well, of course. And some people might feel like, I don't want to even have to do that. Like, but like to show them some of your plan or credentials or why they should back you as well, because going through that process of like months and months of R and D, there's no guarantees. Like if you can, or, and the same as like a manufacturer, some people trying to be like the manufacturer I'm talking to will not negotiate. Well, in a way you have to, you know, sell yourself and con- convince them to get that buy in to be able to be proper partners. And you might feel like, why should I have to do that? But it's just, it's just natural yeah, human instinct. The relationship. Behavior. Yeah. I think at the start, like ultimately you just want to make sure that you're vetting them, that they're aligned with you. Mm-hmm. I think the negotiations, yes, you can always try everything's negotiable, but I think it will come later when proof's yeah, in the pudding. For sure, for sure. You know, if you build a strong relationship and you're building an exceptional product, well then once that demand grows, well, then you're going to have more negotiating power. So 100%. I think just try not to burn bridges before you launch. I think it's building a relationship and a collaborative one that you can lean into and you can work together on. And yet they have to align with your values. They have to align with you as a person. If you feel it's a struggle to talk to them, it's not going to be good for the long run. And that's what I found with my first mm-hmm. manufacturer. I found a lot of pushback. I found a lot of negativity. I felt like they weren't forthcoming. So I was like, no, nah, this isn't this isn't who I am as a person. Like yeah. I'm... I love collaboration. I love relationship building. I'm like, I have connections and partnerships with people that I've worked with my entirety of my business, like loyalty. And that's super important as well. So I think just, yeah, knowing what your needs are, what your non-negotiables are just with anything like product manufacturer, 
anything, marketing, anything. Like you've got to set those parameters. So you get your first batch of like completed stock in the packaging. It's all ready to go. What happens next? Yeah. So it was actually really interesting. So once I got this, um, just I'll backtrack just a little mm. bit. So once I got the final sample yep. from the new manufacturer. How was that day I as well? Was, Talk to me through oh like how goodness. you felt. I was so excited, <laughs> I relieved. I was elated. I think I just, for me, it was just a sign that my gut intuition was right, that I could push it further. And now people say like, you know, your lotion has the best dry down, but I still feel so hydrated even the next day. Like that's like a big, like besides the results and how it feels and the smell and everything, like just the ha- the whole technology around that. And even now my manufacturer says, look, I'm, I'm you're glad I like you because I will not make this product ever again. Yeah. It is extremely hard to make. And I think that's where people sometimes a connotation of maybe our products are a little bit more on the expensive side, but the work and the research and the technology that goes into every single batch is above all else. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that I think, you know, we never pass on like ingredients, you know, go up in price and, you know, our technology and everything, but we never pass that on to the customer. I think for us, well, we haven't yet anyway, but I think for us, you know, un- maybe the communication of me sharing how it is made might give awareness, but yeah, he literally said to me like, Priscilla, you're lucky we have a relationship because if someone came to me today and said, can you remake these? I would say absolutely <laughs> not. Like it is a <laughs> head spin to make because you've got to heat it. You've got to cool it. You've got to go through all the, it's a, it's uh. a whole thing to get it to what it is. And um, yeah, so I just was so excited and I spoke to um, my auntie who has kind of been through the stage. Like she is, as well as my mom, like they're very harsh critics when it comes to the beauty side and the beauty world. And uh, my auntie's bought thousands of products over the years. And she did say to me, like, um, with when I was working with the first manufacturer, she's like, so you're creating this product? And I was like, yep. She's like, this might sound, this might sound harsh, but you know that there's millions of lotions in the world. I said, yeah, but mine's going to be better. And I don't know if that was naivety or what, but I just said it straight away. I was like, yeah, but mine's going to be better. And she's like, okay. And then I showed her the new, like after I got rid of the other manufacturer, I worked for another year and a half with the new manufacturer, finally got it to a stage where I felt proud enough to show her. And I said, just try it and just let me know. And she literally called me and she said, I eat my words. I am sorry. This is liquid gold. I'm not even joking. Like she goes, I've had psoriasis and scars on my legs, on my lower shins for as long as I can remember. I've only applied it three times and I already can see a reduction. She's like, it's magic. And I was like, oh my God. Like I knew like based on the trials and the tests that we did that there was efficacy with the product. But to hear my auntie who was so skeptical actually go and say like, even to this day, she's like, Priscilla, I not, it's unmatched. Like she goes, yeah. look, she goes, I will never cheat on you. But the times that I've, someone's given me a product, I thought, you know what? I'll try it. I've either broken out. It's felt greasy. It's felt terrible. Like she goes, I'll never again. So I think it was just someone in my family who normally is biased and he's like, oh, da- that's amazing. You know, family want to support you. My auntie was not that person. She was like a realist, Priscilla, like you're really wanting to bet on this, like your whole life savings. And again, she's risk averse, right? My mom's like, oh, this is so exciting. Like <laughs> it was so funny to see them, how different they were. But I think that gave me the confidence that if my auntie was skeptical and she's come around after trying the product, then I did have something special. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like when you can win over the skeptics and you hear them talk yeah. about their experience with your product, then you know you got something yeah. special. You know? And I think the proof was in the pudding when my skin started to change as well. Mm. Like people could see firsthand, like, wow, Priscilla, what are you using on your skin? Um, and so I think- that as well was proof in the pudding. But then outside of me, at least it was other people that were trying. And I think that's what happened as soon as we launched and we were building a community from the moment I was on the train, um, having the call with my mum, I was that from that moment I was thinking about, okay, well, if this is going to be something, what's the brand mm-hmm. build the community. So I was building the community two and a half years before launch. And so by the time I launched, I, was able to launch to people that were really engaged and kind of interested in what this whole scope was about. Um, and yeah, so we launched and it just was a whirlwind. It just literally picked up and it had its own life and it just, I couldn't, I was literally running behind it. I couldn't catch it. So what were the steps once you got that, you know, final completed batch? Did you say, okay, from this batch, we're going to 
sell X percent and give away X percent? Like what was the initial launch strategy? And obviously now when you launch a product with years of experience, it's a little bit more, I'm sure, detailed. But what was that launch plan? What did you do with that original stock? How did you navigate yeah, that? Yeah, literally I mm. was like to my partner, so I've got a plan for launch. He's like, yep, what is it? I said, we're pretty much going to give the product away. He's like, what? <laughs> He's like, you're nuts. I'm like, nah. I'm going to give it away. I go, I would rather reviews and I would rather feedback and I would rather people telling me truthfully what they think about it. Um, and so I started seeding to cust- like friends of friends and micro influencers and anyone that I could, that I have was talking with for the couple of years before um, launching the brand. And yeah, then once traction started happening. Like it was like, we didn't have any, we didn't do any digital paid media for a year. Um, I started building an email list maybe two months before launch. And that was because we had the community there. So we started to get them engaged. Yep. It's going to be a skincare product. Yep. It's going to do this. We started notifying them. People started signing up. So those people became customers, which was great straight out the gate. Um, so we had like a small batch of like what we potentially would sell, but pretty much gave away a lot of the first run. But then I had already another run in the works because I knew that with the first run, hopefully could come sales and I needed to have backup ready to go. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much what we did. We were able to, um, seed out so many products. And then from the initial people that bought from our email list and social media within two weeks, people coming back being like, wow, like these before, like setting before and afters testimonials. And then we just shared it. Like we said, are you okay for us to share? Got permission. And again, we just shared organically, like no paid media, no nothing, no macros, influencers, just literally social media, Instagram at the time, TikTok wasn't around, um, but literally all over Instagram and we turned Instagram yellow, I think people now call it. So that was crazy. I, I do remember that. Yeah. You were one of the other brands that were absolutely everywhere at that time. And like, I always ask people that have built big businesses, you know, how'd you make your first million dollars? Cause it's, it's very often very different to, you know, where your customers come from today. So no paid media. I imagine if you're just not even doing macros back then, nearly all of it was from like organic, word of mouth, micro of mouth, influences, yeah. maybe a little bit of Google. And that was, that's how you built your first million. Yeah, literally. Crazy. Yeah. And I literally had one product and we had this mediocre site. It was <laughs> not great, but it did its job. And yeah, the power of word of mouth. So where did, where did the name come from? When so did that yeah, Bang and Body. Okay. So I was sitting at my desk and I just... I don't know, I was reminiscing. I was going back to school and how things were. And I guess that was like when my skin started to get quite bad. And yeah, I just remember the boys at school, like, you know, it was very um, communicative and they were like, oh, damn, she's banging. And obviously these girls didn't really look like me at the time. Um, Yeah, I did not look like them. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, why is she banging? Why isn't everyone banging? Like, why is it such a stereotypical thing? And I think bringing out like, again, our yellow tube, which was firming, but obviously helped with many different benefits. And I think for me, I just wanted everyone to feel banging in their own skin. And so I wanted syllables. So whether it was BB or S, I wanted something that rolled off the tongue that was memorable, but also had meaning. And so it was very like nostalgic in not a good way for me when I was young. But mm-hmm. ultimately I thought, you know what, I want to bring that power back and I want to give power to the people that everyone can feel banging in their own skin. I was how Bang Body was made. I love that. Uh, I love that kind of callback to to what started the brand and it's become this massive thing, you know, outside of anything you could have imagined in high school. And it still comes back to that like experience. Um, <laughs> you mentioned building community was really important. 50,000 followers, I believe you had before you launched. As you started to grow, obviously the whole first year is pretty much all organic or community based. What changes did you make in the business? Obviously paid media, but talk to me about what you changed or what marketing channels you started using that allowed you to scale beyond that. Yeah. So after the first year, when we got a lot of word of mouth, great reviews, great before and afters, we had a lot of buzz organically. We thought, okay, how can we push this further? And so we were able to then use all of that um, amazing feedback and reviews and talkability and push it to paid media. So we were doing Instagram and like Facebook ads. Um, I think TikTok was just on the rise. So we kind of lent in there a little bit, Um, started investing in SEO, so organic search. I think that's something that's definitely overlooked, but again, it's not something that makes you money overnight. It is a very slow burn, but I guess with the searchability of our banger body, yellow tube, firming lotion, banger body, firming lotion, all these keywords people are using, um, 
you know, and also firming lotion, we wanted to be ranked number one and now we are ranked number one. So I think ultimately, you know, these measures that we put in place to kind of double down on that growth and we had ultimately this one year worth of organic conversations around this yellow tube that we could then communicate. I definitely think the power of PR for sure. Um, you know, Jesse has been amazing where I had a product. I, I was working with her before I even had a product. She honestly thought I was like this hoax. <laughs> she says, she's like, I'm this fake. Like, she's like, Priscilla, do you even have a product? I was like, yes, I promise it's coming. It's just delayed. Like, but that delay actually was a blessing because it gave us a year to work on our strategy for launch. And you know, after that, what would come. So, yeah. So I think definitely like the places that, that we got. And at that time, media placements in print was quite big and very um, credible. So we got a lot of print placements um, alongside our digital testimonials, our digital like articles that we were featured in. So, yeah. And then we started leaning into macros. I think the first macro we ever used was Martha. Okay. Yep. And um, she had just come off uh, Married at First Sight. And at the time it was like, what do we do? Like, I don't know. Do we lean into macros? Like, is like, cause again, we never worked with anyone. And yeah. I think at that time as well, like we're very much aligned with, we will give you the product. If you love it and you come back to us, then we'll, we'll try work together. But previously to that, it was just seeding all organic people buying and loving it. And even a lot of big macros and um, even creators were buying the product, loving it and sharing it without us even having any working relationship. So yeah, we launched, um, so we decided, okay, we'll we'll work with Martha and it just went amazing because then media wanted to talk about it because, Mm. so it was just this synergy around, you know, this public figure loving the brand, talking about the brand and then ultimately getting it picked up with a media um, article and then it could just, it just, yeah, kind of went from there. Um, Which was pretty cool. When was the, like what moment for you, because I know, I don't know if we cover this in this podcast, but you, from day one, like you quit your job to be ready to work on this full time from the start. So a lot of courage, you know, to, to do that, but you were full time from the start. Was it day one or was it, you know, what was the moment for you that you were like, holy shit, like this is real. Like this is more than just this idea, this journey that I went on. It's a real business now. I think the day of launch, which was my last day, like the day before was the last day that in my corporate job, I was all in skin in the game, no plan B. I had risked everything. So I was like, there is no point half-assing this. Like I went back home to mum's. Um, thankfully my now husband, he was working still in his um, chippy. He was, a, he's a, he was a chippy um, in commercial construction. So he was working so he could kind of sustain just a basic living needs. Pay your, you know, whatever basic expenses. Just yeah. literally basic living needs. My mum was so great. She let us stay with her like – rent free. So we could obviously put every last penny that we earned back into the business and every last penny for a very long time went back into the business. And I think that's why we were able to sustain COVID, all of our, you know, production paid out, right? Like everything, like no loans, no nothing. So we serviced all of the rise of COVID and then we'll be able to come out the other end when no one had no idea what was happening with COVID and post COVID. So I think, um, by yeah, ultimately doing that we were able to, you know, really build a really strong plan. But for me, I felt that I needed to do this business justice. If I went back to my corporate job, it meant that I didn't really believe or I did, I had to have a backup or I wasn't ready. And I was like, no, I have to be all in. So I think that day, no one could speak to me. I was a nervous ball of like, I was a nervous wreck. Like, I think like, my husband tried to talk to me and I just was like, you can't talk to me. He's like, what do you mean? Like, I'm tr- I need to talk to you about the business. I'm like, no, like, no, just do not talk to me. And I remember going live at seven o'clock that night and I was freaking out and we saw the orders come in and I was just like, what do you mean? People are bu- like, what? People are bu-? I was like, thank literally, you should have seen me. I was like, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Like I was thanking everybody, like not that they could hear me, but I was just so grateful until this day. I am so grateful for every one of our customers. Like, you know, our business is built on community. They are the heartbeat of the brand and we service them. That's as simple as it gets. Hearing those first few Shopify cha-chings when you've put in like <laughs> years of work and like you said, you're like, will anyone buy this? Like you, you know, you put your, your heart and soul into it and then when people that you don't know start purchasing things from you and then it starts getting busier and busier and it's consistent – I just look back at, you know, those life changing periods and we spoke about what I'm doing now. And like, it's like, for me, 
that like first, you know, year, two years in business where everything's changing. You, like you said, like your life's starting to complete 180 could completely change, but something that you did. And I feel like I just want to highlight this because not a lot of people would be willing to do it is you, you know, had the conversation with your then partner, you know, this might mean moving back in with my mom. Are you okay with that? So many people acquire a level of lifestyle and when they budget in all they can afford to invest in their business, they don't budget in any lifestyle reduction so that they really aren't left with much to work with. How important do you think it was for you to be able to suck it up and be like, I'm going to scale back everything. I'm going to move back in home to, you know, make this dream a reality. Oh, hundred percent. Like I moved back in, I moved back home. So I worked really hard in my corporate career and I was able to get an apartment at a really young age. And thankfully my mom said, rent it out. Don't let that be a stress. Come back home. And because at that point we were living in this tiny apartment. That's when my now husband was like, we want to start a family. We want to get married. Yeah. We want to buy a house. We've worked hard. Let's invest. And so he was on a life trajectory and I was like, wait, let's put our life on hold. And we did like, we got engaged. I, I was 24. So I started thinking about the business at 22, got engaged at 24, launched a business at 25, stayed engaged for six years. I literally <laughs> just got married last year. Um, yeah. So our life has been on a big pause for this business. And so we invested everything into it and yeah, it was so important. I, you know, I, I think I, like, I remember I um, went back home. I stopped getting my nails done. I think I had eyelash extensions at the time, stopped getting that done. Like I literally, all the luxuries was out the door, like done. I was like, nah, back home. Um, no, like going out, take out, like we would cook meals. Like it was a massive lifestyle change, but I think it's something that if you really believe in what you're about to embark on, you will find a way to make it happen. It's just the sacrifices of what you're willing to actually put in place. I love hearing people talk about the sacrifices because I think, look, some people are in a privileged position. They don't need to do that. But a lot of people and the people that really want to change their lives the most are in the position where they might need to, you know, make these sacrifices in order to, you know, live a life or achieve things they, they, they never had before. So I really wanted to make sure we didn't skip past that. Now let's talk about like kind of the second phase of, of Bang & Body and kind of what you've been doing over the more recent years. Um, before we get into like the retail stuff, new product development, as you said, I think you got about nine products now, all 100% natural vegan products. Talk to me about kind of, you know, when you look to launch a new product, because you put so much into that first one, what's your like non-negotiables? If you say, I'm going to make something like, what's your thought process behind each and every one of the new products you've launched? It's yeah, it's pretty much the same philosophy. Like they take a long time. <laughs> they could take up to two years to formulate. Like we do not launch products frequently and quickly. I'm so sorry to our community because they request a lot of products, but we just don't like for us, it's how we can be really purposeful within the, um, routine of one's like skincare, mm -hmm. you know, I guess skincare routine in the sense that we don't believe that you need five different cleansers. Like that's just not what you're going to get for our, from our business. You're going to get a damn good cleanser. That's going to give you results and going to help make your skin the best it can be. And so we really harness and focus on putting as much energy and intention on certain products that we really believe is only going to benefit people's skin. And yeah, that can take upwards of two years. Like we um, launched our last product, which was our Refresh and Renew Everyday Wash in 2020, at the end of 2022. And we didn't launch another product, um, which was our Gloss Balms that we launched this year in April. So there was a massive a gap half, that or, we didn't even yeah. launch anything. And so next year I think is going to be probably one of our biggest launched um, like number of launches that we're doing because we've been working on them for two plus years. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's time that we're like, okay, if we can launch them next year or the year after, we will do that because I think, you know, we go through all these different stages of how a product should be developed and testing and, again, has to go past my skin. If my skin doesn't like it, well, then it's not going to happen. So, um I think, yeah, everything is a process. We take the utmost care because we just believe that our customers deserve the best. And if it means that they have to wait next year to get the best products that we can deliver, well, then that's how it's just going to be. So it's exciting news for all the bang and body lovers. There's a lot more yes, to come in the future. And big requests that yep. have been, you know, um, shared for many, many years. So yeah, we're excited to bring them out. I'd love to know a little bit around kind of your go-to-market plan, your launch plan for, for some of your new products. I read, I think, one of the statistics out 
before, you know, for the Illuminating Lotion, 50,000 wait list. You sold one every second uh, on launch week. The Refreshment New Body Wash, you had a 30K wait list in, in, in the lead up to the launch. I read one of your like lip gloss ones, you were selling like one every 30 seconds. Like you're not just like bringing in all these random products off the big hero product and they're not really adding, you know, anything to the customers or anything to the business. What is your thought process behind the launch and the marketing plan behind one of these products you've spent so long working on? Yeah, thank you. I think um, I think the beauty about this is that we listen really closely to our customers. And so by the time we do bring out a, a product and they get a whiff of what that is, well, they're like, oh my God, thank God. They're like relieved at that point. Yeah. And so I think that's where it helps because we have built such an engaged community that we really value what they have to say and things that we are working on that isn't a quick thing. It takes years for some of the requests that we believe is aligned to what we want to do. Um, but again, like it is a process. So I think with the go to market strategy, we definitely look at, and we're obviously working on a formula that's a long time in the making. And we've taken that from inspiration from our customers and what they want. And then I think just ultimately when it's like a couple of weeks out, we kind of seed, we start to do emails, uh, um, send outs being like, you know, something that you've wanted for a very long time is coming, sign up to the first snow. And then that, that obviously drives a lot of interest. And then we keep linking that and keep talking about it. Then it's a week out and then we're like, stay tuned. Like it's, it's a bit of a tease at the start yeah. because we just want that to be something super exciting. People are waiting for, people are kind of invested in what we're about to launch. And then literally two days out, we're like, okay, sign up for early access. Like you got to be in it to get the first um, look at what we're putting out. Um, and then, yeah, our wait list just goes crazy because people want to be the first. And also too, because there's only limited number mm-hmm of units per first run yeah. because we don't want to over, we don't want to ever over order. Um, and not that that would probably ever happen because our community is so engaged and we're pretty good with our manufacturers and the frequency of, and we want to keep our products fresh. So the frequency mm-hmm. is quite high for, um, what's the standard lead time for one of your products? If there is a standard, like, is it month, two months to, to manufacture? Make, uh, to manufacture? I think most manufacturers would be, I think with our relationship that we've built over the last eight years, I think it's between, 10 days to two weeks. Oh, that's so good for you. So you can keep everything really fresh. If we it's like that. keep yeah. everything really fresh. Sometimes lead times are longer based on packaging demands. And if the schedule is conflicted with other clients yeah. that they can't fit us in. So, you know, at times that does happen. And AKA our jumbo, like, yeah. you know, our jumbo firming lotion, we can't keep that skew in stock. As mentioned, it is very hard to formulate our normal firming lotion. Yeah. So now having to make 400 mils of it, mm. it's just a slower process. So, you know, there's obviously things like that where, you know, we're trying to pump out as many firming lotions as we can and we have to put on pre-order or it's sold out and sign up, you know, to know when it's available. And people are like, why is it keep selling out? And it's, we're trying to keep up with demand, but you know, it's just like one of those things. So yeah, ultimately we have a really a solid launch plan. We try to like, at, like our PR and our teams yep. know what we're doing next year. So yep. we're already planning for those launches and when we need to see to media, when we need to pitch things when we need to see to, you know, content creators, micro, like all of that. Like we have a full strategy of when things need to be done and how it goes. But ultimately it's, yeah, being able to communicate to the customer, getting them on the wait list, building the demand and going from there. Were you surprised, like the jumbo you mentioned, sold out over four times, you only launched it last year. Were you surprised how popular the jumbo was compared to the normal size or- I, I can't say that I was surprised because it was a request a yeah. since literally like we launched the firming lotion and then think of from a year out when people were like using tubes every four to six weeks, they're like, we need a bigger size or I need a pump. I need like the demand of them wanting more mm. was more frequent. And so, yeah, so pretty much second year in at least once, twice a day, can I have it in a jumbo? Can I have it? So it was a, it was a very, uh, like it was a heavy demand and we, it wasn't that we didn't want to do it. We just needed to find packaging compa- um, compatibility. You know, we had to go through all of that kind of testing and yeah, it was a big process. So glad that we've got it and it's there. Like we also, we still want to do tweaks. Like I feel like sometimes our logo on our bottle, you can't really see. So like it's a yellow bottle, you know, it's ours, but I think ultimately for expansion and things like that, we want to see how we can make it more um, appealing and easy for people to see from a distance. So we're not perfect, but in terms of where we put our efforts in our formulation, um, yeah, is the reason why it's sold out so many times. 
So it's still like having that attention to detail to the small little improvements as you go. It's not like, okay, we launched V1 of the jumbo. That's it. It's locked in. Let's move on to the next. It's the constant attention Always to that to deliver iterating. the best product, yeah. full full service, not just yeah. the ingredients itself. Now we mentioned um, kind of, and we'll start to, we'll ask a few final things on this and we'll start to wrap up, but mention kind of what the first million dollars look like for a business. Now as a brand that's been around for coming up on six years, has much changed? Like what, like, where so if people can start to if they're like a six figure or a low seven figure business okay what does it look like to grow my brand what are the sort of main channels that you know you are finding your 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 customers or retaining repeat purchase customers from at the moment yeah I definitely think you know your product speaks for itself if you've got a high retention yeah. through your product then that's golden you know things could turn off tomorrow and you would have your your customers X percent come and back, that's yeah that's why like product development and product execution and product efficacy should be the utmost importance, you know, outside of the packaging and the prettiness and how your brand is what it represents, your product does the talking. And so I think ultimately for us, our repeat customers, our loyalists, people that are in our email database, constantly growing that SMS is insane, like constantly growing that. Um, and the cut through on that is massive, but then ultimately is our digital marketing and, yep. you know, paid media strategy, you know, ultimately going, okay, where's the balance from new customer acquisition to potentially mid or bottom of funnel, which is more of your retargeting and yeah. like kind of the warmer leads where we don't really do much investment anymore because we do have our customers and yeah. that continues to grow the more that you can bring in new customers from top of funnel. That will feel so it in, yeah. ultimately it's like, you know, you're trying to ensure that you're um, giving your customers the best experience. You are notifying them through email, through SMS, through loyalty program. We have that. So they earn points to redeem and they feel a part of something. So we nurture and we are very much involved in the experience and making it very positive for our existing customers. And then with new customers, it's the introduction to the brand, you know, bringing them on a journey, you know, more about my story, why I started getting them involved. Like, yeah, it's all about that. It's a, it's a very much, you know, it's like a, an actual funnel. Like it looks like a funnel. You got to bring people in and then nurture them and then keep so that going. with that paid media space is, um, I know you were chatting briefly before we started to you about kind of your experience with different partners. Do you do your digital marketing in-house or do you use agencies or has it been different times, different things? Yeah. So pretty much I launched and I didn't do any paid media for a year. It was all word of mouth, all organic through social um, and obviously emails and things like that. And then decided, you know what? Yep. We've got to start to like invest in areas that is going to help grow the business, which was paid marketing. And we, we did lean into agency because we felt like we just didn't have the capability, the resources. I'm not an expert. So I really leaned on people that knew a little bit more than me, but I think I gave maybe too much trust and credit. And I think that's where agency vortexes can become mm. quite um, cannibalizing in a business. And I think the awareness piece is going to be super important for anyone that goes into agencies, making sure that you understand the platform, you can see your own account, you can see your own reporting. You know, it's not just a smoke screen from agencies that are presenting you a report because at the end of the day, they don't pay the bills. So I think knowing where your money is going um, is going to be really important. So yeah, we've pivoted heavily. We've brought a lot of things back in house. We have full control over our creative. We have full control around how much we spend, our daily profitability. Like as we've grown, we've become more profitable, more um, sustainable in our growth trajectory for new products and how we market and our messaging and everything. Like it's just, you have, you will always have more control if you have awareness and ownership of certain things. hundred percent. And just to add another point onto that, um, and it sounds really obvious and like, come on, that wouldn't happen. I, I've heard so many horror stories. You said, make sure you have access to your own account. Make sure you own your own account. Oh yes. I'm sure you've heard the stories of agencies. Oh, we'll set all that up for you. Don't worry about that. We'll do it all for you. And then you three months in, six months in, two years, you try and break contract and leave. They're like, okay, well, you know, we own your ad account. And then you've lost all that data. It's a nightmare. So if you're going to get into an agency and again, like there are times where it's good because you only have so many skills and so much resource at the start. How can you be expected to be an expert of anything, but just be aware of what can go wrong at that time. Yeah. And just like, you know, look around, you know, agency isn't just the only um, way to do it. Like, you know, I think you can definitely look at other areas, whether it's freelancers, whether it's definitely. learning and upskilling yourself, or I think definitely there's just so many different ways you can go about it. But I think the awareness hats, hat needs to be on um, when you are working with manufacturers, when you're working with agencies, things that move the needle in your, in your business needs to have your utmost attention. 
from your product. If you don't have product, you can't sell it to your customer. If you want to find new customers, you got to make sure it's cost effective or else you'll lose a lot of money. Um, so making sure that the big move on, the big needle movers that ultimately also cost the most money, you mm. have the most awareness and you don't trust easily. hundred percent. And I know you've spoken at length about like your customer experience is such a big priority for your brand. I know now that you fulfill and have your own warehouse and all your own orders, but talk to me about some of your past experience with 3PL and c- kind of your reasoning to take that back in house. Yeah. So started um, Bang and Body and I was packing on my mum's living room floor and then she could pitch in and help whenever she could after work, before work. <laughs> I felt like I was packing around the clock and amongst doing everything else. Um, it just got to a stage where I really felt like I didn't have any other options. I had to either hire staff to come into my mum's house or I would have to look at a 3PL. And so I thought, you know what, I'll look at a 3PL. At that point, we also were looking at small warehousing to um, put all that empty packaging because my house was just becoming a vortex and yeah, it was getting too much. I was staring at boxes all day. Um, so moved to a 3PL and it seemed okay until I soon realized from a first hire, I said, yep, our customers are amazing. Like shouldn't get many. And they were like, so uh, uh, I'm getting like 50 emails plus like a day. And it's been a couple of days. Like, is this normal? And I was like, no, what's going on? And they're like, well, they're saying that they're not getting their orders and it's been like three weeks. I was like, what? Three weeks? You're ki-. like, I was dumbfounded. I was like, no, get me on the phone. Got on the phone to them and I was like, hey, we're getting customers say that they haven't received their orders in three weeks. They think we're a scam. Like we're getting bad reviews. Like what is happening? Oh, we're so sorry. We um, haven't been able to find any staff to fulfill your orders. And I was like, so you didn't want to notify me? Like I could have made an executive decision to either come in and help you pack them or bring them back to my mom's house and and fill them. And they were like, oh, we're trying our best. And I was just like, no, I called my husband crying, being like, what are we going to do? Like our business is in jeopardy. Like, again, I thought like the world, the walls were closing in. I thought it was the end of us. Like, and at the start, you think problems that maybe you look back and go, okay, it was fixable. You think that the world is ending. So just remind yourself, you're doing a great job. There is a solution to everything. It's not going to fall over. Like, you know, you reassure yourself because I was honestly a mess. I was like, this is not happening now. Like, anyway. And so um, my husband was literally like, you, I'm going to give you a week to the end of the week, get out of this contract and we're going to move everything into this empty warehouse and we're going to pack these orders. And I was like, okay. At that time we were just going into lockdown. So the girl that I hired, her family, unfortunately, her um, family cafe had closed because of COVID. So they were all out of work. So I was able to employ them. Wow. into the business to help us pack these 4,000 so orders. <laughs> so there were 4,000 orders in arrears. It was shocking. Um, but, yeah, so within a week or two we were able to get everything up to date and from that moment on my husband now has been perfecting our fulfilment in-house and he set up a full camera service. Like, you know, you can scan something, bring up a code and the camera, it, t- it shows you a full video of it being packed. Wow. So he's That's sick. That's yeah. so cool. So if someone's like, I didn't get my firming, firming lotion. Like here you go. We literally have the proof that it's being packed. That's so good. I love innovations like on the back end of businesses as well, because they can make such a big difference. Now we kind of spoke about that challenge and I'm sure that was a big one, as you mentioned as well, just for, you know, people that are in that first year or starting the business, you don't have the experience to look back on reflection, but there's always challenges. There's always problems in business. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, like you said, at times you can feel like, how am I going to get through this? But you always do. And you always come out the other side yeah. and there will be better days. So like not let that get you down while you're in them, because if you get too emotional while you're in those moments, you don't make your best decisions Yeah. and you can go back into that circle of, you know, problem rather than solution. But I like to ask this question because I think we always learn so much of it as, you know, e-com entrepreneurs or D2C entrepreneurs. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Quietly dying over here. Stand by. <coughs> what I was going to say before I had a cough attack is that what's one, the one thing looking back, the like biggest money wasting like mistake you made? Because I think from those mistakes where we waste so much money, there's always such a good lesson for them. And I just think, you know, people can learn from other people's lessons. Is the one that stands out is like, we wasted so much money on that and we didn't need to. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's definitely moments where I'm like, that was a lot. Okay. So I think waste, waste money. I think that's probably the wrong word to use because I think their learnings, like obviously I wasted $80,000 to get my now manufacturer, but it was a learning. 
I definitely spent a hell of a lot of money in agencies and people that I thought I trusted when really it was not necessary. Like I didn't have to spend that much money. I, I, I could have simplified the process. I could have trusted my gut intuition. I could have um, had more awareness, learnt more about the things that were going on within the agency that we could have applied ourselves. Like, yeah, you have to spend money in certain areas, but you don't have to spend that much money. And I think that's what I realized when um, I went through those big learnings and also everything is damn negotiable. Yeah. And I learned that the hard way. And we can, it can be really easy to be like, you know, particularly when you don't have a lot of experience to guide you by, you know, when you've tried that in the past, it can be really easy to think that, oh, just, you know, I can't be, I can't figure it out myself. I'll throw money at it in the form of an agency, in the form of a partner and they'll fix it for me. If you can't figure it out and fix it, there's just only a very small chance that you paying someone else to do it, who cares less, who has less on the line yeah. than you is going to be able to yeah. figure it out. So and I, think I think that's good to yeah. yeah and realize. I think too, like when things aren't working, if you have the power to pivot, it's only going to, it's literally going to change your world. Like I will never forget, we worked with an agency and no joke, they were losing $40,000 a month. Yeah. And they were like, we need more time. We just need more time. And I was like, um, are you losing $40,000 or am I losing $40,000? Because I can't sustain this. If we yeah. keep losing, how is this going to be sustainable? And they're like, we just need one. Anyway, so we gave them adequate time because we thought, okay, you know what? We'll give them time. Again, like I'm a reasonable person. And then in the end, I just thought, you know what? Their business isn't on the line. Mine is. And if I don't make a decision now, then I don't know what's going to come of this. And so I remember that day I just said, that's it. We're taking it all in house. We're, we're running with this and we're finding a different strategy. And then Jake, my husband, um, God love him, tradie once before in his old life. Now he's like a skincare tech, does all about web coding and digital platform. Like he's in, in the weeds. And um, yeah, he's like, okay, I'm like, you're going to take it on until we can figure the next steps out. And no joke, he literally started running some ads, had no idea what he was doing in the platform and they were already generating money. If you're already losing $40,000 a month, what can you lose in that literally, situation? We gained. Like yeah. we literally thought we were going to like, just be like, wow, what are we doing? But we actually literally, as soon as we said bye and as soon as we tweaked a few things, it was like crazy. Do you know Adam and Raquel from, who was Elijah? Yeah. Yeah. They've got a similar story. In I that. love them. Yeah, they're doing a great they're the job. Best. They're killing it. Um, yeah. With agency? No, they was, you know, losing a lot of money with an agency and Adam's like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to learn it. And like yeah. it was the best decision they ever made 100%. As a business. It is honestly, I think going back to the uh, narrative that, you, no one will love your business as much as you do. No one will have the duty mm. of care as much as you do. They will try and there is definitely need for people in your business and around your business to service and sustain it. But in terms of the heart and where you feel, as I said, the you need to be the protector to your biggest money movers. So like your manufacturing, your paid media, like you need to oversee that. You can't just be like a set and forget, oh, they will just deal with it. Like you need to know everything before you can delegate that out. hundred percent. I think that's one of the main things. So many people, you know, that are meant to be like, okay, I'm getting ready to launch. Which agency should I go with? Like, no, 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 no. Like you cannot, like you said, you cannot outsource the most important functions of your business. You need to fully understand that, figure out a way to make it work and to get it profitable. And then when you're ready to potentially scale or amplify that and you have a good enough understanding, whether that be hiring someone in-house or going to an agency, you'll never be able to keep anyone accountable or yeah. know what's going well and what's not if you don't have a yeah. base level understanding of that skill. Um, so that's a really good lesson as well. Before we wrap up, I just want to ask you some questions and get some advice and thoughts for people that might be early stage in, in their business. Now, first one, if you're starting your brand again, and I know people ask those questions all the time, let's say you do have the knowledge and understanding you do now because obviously – doesn't really make sense to ask that question otherwise. And you had your product, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have a big marketing budget. What would kind of your go-to-market plan be? Or what are some of the early, you know, activations or experiences that you would, you know, do to try and get your brand off the ground today in 2024? I feel like I would do a similar thing. Yeah. Like I didn't have a marketing budget. Like I had no marketing budget when I launched back then. Yeah. And then even if I had a marketing budget, I would still be putting that into stock to get, the product into people's hands. And that's what I wanted. I just wanted yellow tubes in people's hands everywhere. And I would do anything to make that happen. And I think, you know, never underestimate the power of gifting. I think that is like the biggest thing because with gifting, you get genuine um, testimonials and reviews and content. Like you can say, you can reach out to people like love to gift this to you. Um, just would love your genuine feedback. 
you know, if you love it, feel free to share. And then you would be surprised. People will do stories. People might do a piece of content that you can pull, that you can reshare on your socials. I just feel like that's just one piece that can be a bit like missed. Like it just could be missed because you think, oh, that was maybe the old days. But I feel like there's still a power to it and circulation. Like if people talk, you know, you want people to talk and that's where the word of mouth generates. And so I think ultimately if I had just say a little bit of a set budget, I would go, okay, what can I allocate to gifting and seeding for um, reviews and feedback and content? Like that would be a bucket. And then I would go, okay, well, is there any room for potentially paid media? Like Mm -hmm. I think I might start just a little bit earlier just to support the seeding. So if People are seeing an ad, but then they're seeing someone that they trust use the product. They might be like, oh, I know, I hang on, that brand was that person and that, and it all links together. So then maybe I'll have a small budget, even if it's $20 a day, just trying to find our customers, working out audiences, playing in the platform. Um, and then I think like them two together is like really powerful. And then from there, I think if you did have extra budget, you know, looking at PR, and even if it's not like even from a retainer, maybe it's like a project basis mm-hmm. based on, hey, I've just launched this product. I've seeded to a few people. Is there a way that I can align with any placements or is there like a small event where we can get bigger influencers together? We can do some, like it doesn't have to cost money. It could be like guerrilla marketing. You could do posters like on a sidewalk and then at the end of the sidewalk, there's like a little sh- a little shop front and you've, I don't know, like you could do so many things like with a low budget. It's just your creativity that needs to go wild. A hundred percent. That's the thing. If you don't have, if you don't have a big budget, creativity is your is your best friend. Right? And sometimes it's better because people that have big budgets they're not creative. Get so lazy. Us, yeah. So people that don't have big budgets, we work creatively in the sense of going where the consumer, what would excite us, what would entice us, what would make us go, whoa, that's so cool. Where big budgets, they're like, how can we go loud? But is there? But the connection sometimes is lost. So yeah, don't underestimate that. And I think as well too, um, you know believe that you can do it for so long. I believe not. Nah, I can't even look at ads. I'll break it. I can't even look at the platform. I'll, I'll, I'll literally stuff it up. I, I I can't do it. You can do it. Like don't let anyone else make you think otherwise. And what's one thing, you know, today that I know this is cliche, but for someone that's gone through the journey you have, I think there's so much value in it. What's one thing, you know, today that you wish you knew at the start of like, okay, launch day. My God, that's such a that's such an interesting question. What would I know? What would I wish I knew? Like, well, let's just say you yeah. could give yourself one piece of advice back then on back launch then. day. You're like, Priscilla, I'm from the future, six years. Let me just tell you this one thing: one foot in front of the other, and keep going. Don't look back. There'll be mistakes. There'll be challenges, but one foot in front of the other, and just keep going. Like the belief and the resilience. Will persevere like you will get you'll get there and I think they'll probably also tell me be aware don't trust too easily yeah <laughs> and all the other things that we just spoke about but I definitely think it's all about the belief it's only you and your beliefs on how far you can go if you're putting a ceiling on yourself well then that's the ceiling if mm-hmm. you're putting the ceiling in space well then that's the ceiling so your limit is only based on what you believe 100 percent, and that's what I try and say all the time it really does start like only people that are cr- like crazy enough that get to change the world are the ones that are crazy enough to think they can and like change their life. It doesn't have to be change the world, but change your life. And then your, your loved one's life, your people around you, like you, it, it all starts with belief. And that's, you know, one of the biggest things that, you know, I attribute my, you know, success and, and all the random things I've been able to achieve all started because I believed I could. Yeah. And I think as well too, like the worthiness, I think as well, like you believe you can, but also that you're worthy of deserving something as well. I think people, and I was the same, I was so dismissive of, oh no, like it's okay. Like, no, I'm good. Like, you know, you just, you just don't feel like you're empowered that way. You don't, you don't feel like you can do it and then feel like, oh, I've I've worked hard. I deserve that. You know, that deserving and that proudness is like kind of something that we're not really taught and something that we're quite like resistant to. But I think if you can open that mindset around, you know, really kind of setting new bars of what your beliefs are and then also what your what you deserve. I think it's a full circle and you working hard and you putting one foot in front of the other, you going above and beyond for yourself in your company for others because that is the whole point of why you do business. You're servicing others. So if you feel that you're worthy of accepting whatever comes to you because you're giving only good vibes and only giving out good things, then you will see that flourish further. A hundred percent. I love that you brought that second point up, the worthiness, because I talk about this a lot and I feel like 
that's me kind of projecting my own privileged experience of not having the lack of, or didn't feel like I was unworthy. But for so many people, you say you can believe in yourself and that you can, and, and maybe you just can't connect to that. But going back and reprogramming those beliefs that you're not worthy and showing yourself that you are worthy of these things, because I think you're hundred percent right. You need to feel worthy within yourself and ready before the world will give you what you, what you want, what you, what you yeah. really desire. Yeah. So that was a great point. And, and, and th- finally, we can't talk about bang your body and all the amazing things you've done in the successful business you've built without talking about the retail journey. Now started in Mecca, a um, couple, two and a half odd, six really successful years there. And then a pivot to Sephora to help you enable, you know, more international growth. Talk to me, um, first of all, just about the process of how did you get into Mecca from the start as a new startup brand? <laughs> Oh my God, it was wild. I, yeah, that was, again, I feel like could be a bit woo-woo for people, but I feel like the stars aligned, to be honest. <laughs> I feel like, I don't know what I was push, putting out there, but something just happened that day. So pretty much I went to Mecca land with my twin sister. Um, it was here actually in Sydney and we're from oh, Melbourne. Wow, cool. So we decided to make a girl's trip out of it. We'll go to Mecca land. And I remember, I'm I'm a bit of a journal Person. So I remember writing in my journal, like, so excited to go to Mecca land, so excited to meet Joe Horgan, so excited to meet Gemma Watts, right? Funny. And I was like, oh my God, why am I writing this? But anyway, cool. So cool that you were specific. I literally as well. specific. specific. I was like, so excited. I'm, and I was just writing like my feelings and everything. And it was so funny with Gemma. I love her so much. Um, I ended up being on her podcast, but it was just hilarious how this all unfolded. And, um, Anyway, so I said, yep, so excited, so excited, all good. We get there and I was working with, well, I at the time was giving product to Al Ferguson. So she was, she loved the product. She was like, um, I think working with us, doing some content and she was on a panel um, for Mecca and we were there in support of her and I had some product in my bag wanting to top her up. So anyway, I was like, so nothing cool. to do with Joe, nothing to do with Mecca. Um, and she came off the stage and we had been talking online but never met in person. So I went up to her and said, Hi, I'll like, I'm Priscilla from She's like, oh my God. And we just started talking. And then Joe comes out from behind the curtain and comes up to Al. was like, thank you so much for doing the panel. Like you were amazing. And they kind of looked at me being like, do I know you? And I was like, oh. And, and I, she just like looked at me and engaged with me. And I was like, hi, Joe, I'm Priscilla. You don't know who I am, but I have this business. I literally launched it two months ago. Like fully word, like five minutes pitch that I don't even know what I said. Um, <laughs> I said, I got this product and it's, you know, high performing, it's firming. And she's like, oh, and then I kind of showed her the packaging. She's like, oh, I love the packaging. Oh, wow, that's really cool. And it's made in Australia. She's like, oh, would love to connect you with my team. And I said, okay, yep, no problem. And she's like, and I thought she would just say that and walk off and be like, you know, she's like, no, what's your email? I'll email them right now. I was like, oh my God, she fully got her email out that's and so started cool. emailing her team and was like, hi, I've just met Priscilla. She's got this amazing business. Love to. And she fully CC'd me in the email and everything. And it was insane. I think I've still got the email. Um, and I was like, what just happened? Oh my God. Okay. And then we wrapped up the event. All good. On my way out, <laughs> Gemma Watts and the shameless girls were walking back into the center and I was walking out and my sister turned around and was like, she must've saw, saw them. was like, oh, hi. Like I'm, and then I was like, oh my God. Hi. And then I met Gemma Watts. So I met Joe and then I met Gemma on my way out wow. of the event. And then I connected with Gem. And then, yeah, I was on a podcast and it was like a full circle moment, but it was just really crazy that that all kind of unfolded. That's such a cool experience. Talk about like, you know, right place, right time. Once you've, you know, ticked, you know, belief and the worthiness and you've put the action in that the universe can conspire to make oh, things really happen Oh, it's never underestimate the universe. It was like 100%. shocking for me because at that point I was just like, I didn't even know what I was like. I was writing my feelings of excitement. I didn't even like put in any set stones or anything like that. And then, yeah, pretty much from that moment after I was speaking with Jo, um, her team connected with me and I kind of was on a journey with them. So we had just launched two months later, I met Jo and then 12 months or like 11 months later, I'd launched into Mecca. So during that journey, we were showing our like progression reports. So we gave them pitch decks, we showed them placements we were in, we showed our, our growth like trajectory and got to a point where um, there were other retailers knocking on our door at that point. And I just went back to the team and I said, Hey guys, we've been building on this relationship for nearly a year. Um, would just really love to know if you're keen. So fine if you're not, but I need to start making decisions. And they're like, no, 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 we, we want you. Let's put this in motion. Yeah, let's go. So yeah, that's kind of how it all unfolded. And then we launched um, into Mecca. We sold out of three months worth of stock in eight hours. <sighs> 
What? Yeah. And, they would have loved you. And then we were the number one and number two product on their website for a week as their best sellers, which I think I'm not sure if that's ever happened before for an Aussie so female cool. founded brand. But yeah, it was a whirlwind and it was the most amazing pinch me moment. Everything was great. And then it got to a point where we just felt like our exclusivity was coming to an end. And we thought, you know, at that point we really didn't have much flexibility because we were very exclusive to Mecca. Um, so we thought, all right, well, now's the time to kind of look at what our long-term growth is going to be, which is international expansion. And we felt that Sephora and also they also came to us and pitched to us and and it was one that we just couldn't really refuse. It was amazing and they're great partners and I just feel like from that um, conversation and the partnership we have now and the trajectory for where we want to go globally, I think it was just the right move to make. So good. Um, I think like – those decision-making processes and the thought processes because like you can have a good relationship with one person, but then you, like so many people will, will fear the unknown and they'll stick with what they know, even though it limits the future. And like you said previously uh, earlier in the podcast, like one of the biggest changes you can make is like, you know, the limits only exist where you set them. And if you set them to, you want to be a big brand in Australia, sure. You've ticked that box. What next? If you want to go beyond that, you need to, you know, take risks and, you know, going with a new partner is, is really good position to be in where they're pitching you. And I'm sure, you know, terms look more um, ideal when you're, when you're being pitched and you're a sought after brand to be able to make those decisions, but still to have the foresight to plan and look out for what's going to be best for the brand long term, And then kind of the courage to, to, to make a change, not knowing and having any guarantee for the work. Um, it obviously has. So congrats to you and, and the brand. Thank you for giving us your time. We could honestly easily speak. We've had you for <laughs> including the pre-podcast, probably about two hours. So that we'll wrap so up and I'll fine. let you go. We'll have to do a part two one time because yes. there's so much else to talk about. But Priscilla, thank you for giving so much value. There's so much value you've just given to, to everyone in the last hour and a half. So congratulations on all the success. Thank like you. It's crazy what you've done. And like you said, come from a family and, and in a position where you didn't have a lot of money, you had to work really hard for everything you had. So, you know, I know what it takes to go through that and you've just kept going beyond and beyond. So congrats. And I'll be watching even more closely what you do from the future. Thanks for having me on. It's been great. For sure. And um, (laughs) for everyone that's been listening and being, oh my God, I love, you know, the products and Priscilla, what she's about. Where's the best place people can find either you or Bang & Body online? Thank you. Yeah, you can jump on um, www.bangandbody.com. That's our website or Instagram is bang&body and TikTok is Bang & Body. Yeah, and for you, because I know there'll be and people that want to follow. And me is Priscilla Hadji and Tony. There you go. <laughs> That's my Instagram, my personal Instagram. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good luck with everything in the Great. future. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.